We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Oh, hallelujah. Let's just love him for a moment. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. If you could turn with me to 2 Samuel 23. And while you're turning there, I'll make a few comments. One, our bishop was uh, going to be home tonight and had every intention. But if you do not know this yet, uh, Brother Johnny Godare's wife passed away on Sunday, I believe it was. And uh, so he was in Calgary over the weekend and flew straight there uh, to be with them, and understandably so. Amen. So that funeral was tonight. And uh, so very sad. This is, these are great people. They've been a great part of this church, and, uh, and this church is very familiar with them. It's just, just remember them in prayer in this time. Amen. And then secondly, uh, we got a lot going on. VBS tonight is out there, and uh, last count, I know they have around 100 kids out there and adults to help rally whatever that takes, and so we're glad that's happening out there. And we have people at Arkansas's camp tonight, and we're glad that they are there. And so just a lot going on. Amen. And then I will say this, just because I think this church would like to know it. She may not want you to know it, but yesterday, not because she wanted to talk to me, she was looking for her kids. Uh, Sister Erica called my phone, and I said, hey, how is it? And she started bawling, crying. She said, it's so beautiful. And she said, we're so overwhelmed that the church did this for us. She was bawling. And uh, you need to know that. She probably doesn't want you to know that, but you need to know that. She was literally, I could hear she was crying. She wasn't just choked up. She was crying, so overwhelmed. So they're having a great time, and we're glad that they're there and having a great time. And once again, thank you, church, for sending them. Amen. Amen, amen. So Second Samuel, in chapter 23, and... I'm going to read quickly, but and usually I, I have pretty short text, but I do, I'm going to read a few verses tonight. Just, just give me a little leeway here. Amen. Verse number eight says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahuite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Ag, the Hararite. The Philistines were gathered together in a troop where it was a piece of ground full of lentils. The people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. He slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. A few more verses. Three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of Bethlehem, well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines drew water out of the well of Bethlehem. That was by the gate and took it, brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. I thank you for your patience in our reading, but let's put our Bibles down and ask that God would help us tonight in the next few minutes in this service. Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful to be in your house tonight. 
And Lord, we ask that you would anoint your word, anoint your servant tonight, anoint our ears to hear. Lord, we want this word to get deep down in our spirit. And that is our prayer in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. There was an article concerning a missionary to Africa, and it was several years ago in Reader's Digest. I'm not even sure if they have Reader's Digest anymore, so it kind of tells you how long ago. But when this man was in Africa, he said that some friends had wrote him a letter, and they stated, we would like to send other men to you. Have you found a good road into your area. And this man wrote back, he says, if you have men who will only come, if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. He said, I want men who will come and make a road. In Leadership Magazine, not too long ago, there was a cartoon, and it pictured a church building And there was a sign in front of the church which read, The Light Church. It wasn't L-I-G-H-T, it was L-I-T-E. And this is what it said, 24% fewer commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe, 15-minute sermons, 45-minute worship service, We have only eight commandments. You choose which eight. We use just three spiritual laws and have an 800-year millennium. Everything you've wanted in a church and less. I know this is, is humorous, but when you talk to people concerning the kingdom of God out in the world and, and just in general, in general... People, and I'm not talking about this church, thank God, but in general, people like to have something that is requiring less of them, less of their time, less of their ability, less, less commitment, if I can say it like that, and, and do just what I need to do to, to stay involved and do what I need to do to be a part of it. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying this because I think it's right. I do not feel that in this church. This church is awesome, and when anything comes about that needs help, this church puts its shoulders to the wheel. VBS tonight is a great example of that. But if we're not careful, sometimes this can creep into our mentality. If we look down through the ages whenever God has done a significant work with His people, He has done it through a band of committed people. Anytime you read through Scripture and you see where God is doing something great among His people, it's not people that are just flippantly living for Him or following Him. It's always through a committed group of people that are serious about living for God. God does not work through lukewarm uh, if I can say groups, and you can see this in the book of Revelation where he is not pleased with it. God's, God's not doing great works through the look, lukewarm, if I can say it like that, but only when we look in Scripture through the fervent or those that are serious about living for God is God doing works. We understand that this is definitely the case when it came to David's kingdom in this period of time, and when David's kingdom was established, and through David's reign, we understand that the name of the Lord in that period of time was published far and abroad, and it was through these committed group of people. But we understand that as great as he was, David did not do it alone. David was a mighty man. David in Acts, it states that he was a man after God's own heart. And David, in all types and in studies, it's unbelievable. And obviously, we got a couple good books out of this church concerning that. But David was an unbelievable man. But you got to understand that David did not do all of this on his own. 
David had a committed band of men, and I believe women, that supported him. Surrounding him were this band of men, and, 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 and they were the ones that many times were accomplishing these feats, obviously under great leadership, obviously under great direction, obviously led of God by the man of God in their life, but it was the people that accomplished these feats. And many times when you read through this and you read the story of David, and I'm not taking away from David, but we think it's David, it's, it's David, it's David. And to a point it is. But it's David with a committed band of people following David doing these feats. And I've come to preach a little bit of faith to you tonight that God's still looking for a committed band of people if great things are going to happen in the kingdom of God. I don't have to stand up here tonight and try to convince you that we have got an unbelievable bishop and an unbelievable pastor. I don't have to try to convince you of that. We know that deep down in our heart or we would not be here. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter how great they are and how mighty they are if there's not a committed band of people that believe in their ministry and are following them and are committed to their vision. (laughs) Hallelujah. Many times we want to know what their vision is. But this is not where I'm headed, but I'm just going to be blunt. But sometimes it's just out of pure nosiness. <laughs> what's your vision for what's going to happen? And really it needs to be, what's your vision so that I can tie myself into it and be a part of it? Because they're not going to be able to, to do it on their own. Yes, they're great. Yes, they're mighty. Yes, they're anointed. But they've got to have a people that not only want to know what it is, but have an attitude that says, I'm going to tie myself into that vision because I want to see it happen. I want to see that vision come to pass. The vision that God gave them and God allowed me to be a part of, I want to be a part of it. Amen. So we understand, as we read through our text, there is examples of these men. If God is going to accomplish this great work among us, He wants to raise up mighty men and women so that they can do great things for the kingdom of God. The church in this day and age is no different. It's got to have committed people that are committed to the kingdom and committed to the cause. One interesting thing about the mighty men of David is when you begin to look at them, they come from very diverse backgrounds. And I love this part, uh, this part about this. I, I'm so thankful that when it comes to the mighty men of David, it's not these chosen people with these great heritages and, 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 and they have the right, uh, the, the right pedigree and, and they're from the right side of the tracks, if I can say it like that. That's, that's not the case when it comes to these men. In 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2, it says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And this is the men that David started with in verse 2. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, they gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. And that portion of Scripture is a little bit different than when you read a little bit later when we talk about the men that David had. I'm going to tell you the type of people that came to David. They're the type of people that are in this place tonight, me and you. Before we found God and before we came to the kingdom of God, we were discontented and and we were in debt. And I don't think that's just financially. I think that's just in life. You're just, you're underneath this, this, this darkness and, and it's hanging over your head and, and we were in distress. Can anybody say amen? But we came to the house of God and we came to the kingdom of God and he washed our sins away. And now it's a little bit different. Hallelujah. But I don't think it stops there. I think God wants us to go on. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes tonight. I want to talk about these attributes that these men had in their life. I want to talk about what was going on with these men. That they would find themselves in scripture as the mighty men of David. What made them great 
was their commitment to the king and to the cause. Those are the two things, the foundational thing that made them great was their commitment. And something should be beating in your heart and my heart tonight. We've come to this kingdom, and I don't know about you, I don't want to just be status quo. I know that we have life, and people are all over this audience that have worked hard today, and, and you woke up early this morning, and, and nothing sounds better right now than a pillow, and I understand that, but beaten down inside of our heart, there's something there. That's why we're here tonight, is because we want to be a part of a kingdom, and we want to do something great for the kingdom of God, and deep down inside, God, I want to, I want to do something that pleases you. I want to see this thing go forward, or we wouldn't be here tonight. I understand that, that you're tired, and I understand that we're weary, but there's still something beaten down inside of our heart that wants to do something great for the kingdom of God. So these mighty men, and I'm not going to be long. I'm going to go through some things that made these men mighty. Just to start with, a mighty man or strong, brave men, men that prevail. And I'm I'm speaking women too, just you understand that. People that prevail. People that don't give up easy. People that, that are strong in the kingdom of God. And I want to go through just a few points that made these men like this and and, and share them with you. And the number one thing that I find that made them mighty, the first thing, was these men learned how to strengthen themselves. If we're going to find out and we're going to, and we're going to follow the man of God and we're going to follow God and, and we're going to be a part of the kingdom and we're going to be mighty in the kingdom of God, I'm going to tell you one of the first things that you're going to have to do, and, I, and I'm not being ugly. We have a pastor and we need to go to them in time of need. And I understand that. And you have peers. And you need to go to your peers in time of need if it's, if it's a good influence. But I'm going to tell you, you've got to learn somewhere in your walk with God, you have got to learn how to strengthen yourself. There's got to be something in you that knows how to get a hold of God when it's only you and God. When your pastor's not there and your good influential friend is not there and possibly your spouse is not there at that time to be a strength to you. You've got to learn how to find a place and strengthen yourself. It states in Chronicles 11 and 19, it says, these also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had who strengthened themselves. It states as an attribute of them that they knew how to get a hold of God and strengthen themselves in these situations. When your strength is up, how we approach life is different. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you understand it. It's a simple concept. But when you're feeling good about living for God and you're strong in the Holy Ghost, your whole perspective of life is different. That's why we're commanded in Scripture to be strong in the Lord. Because it affects the way we live. You know the story of David and Goliath. And you, we've, we've told them, we've heard it, and they're probably telling it in VBS tonight. It's just one of the most known stories. But isn't it interesting that when David's dad sends him to check on his older brothers, and they're out there fighting this battle... David sees Goliath standing there, this giant, this huge man. And David's reaction is so different from anyone else's that was there. And part of us wants to think, oh, David was just cocky. David was just brave. David David just had it. And I don't so much think that. I'm sure there was some of those elements in him. In his nature. But you understand that when he makes a statement in 1 Samuel 17 and 26, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And he does not make the statement, who would defy my family? Who would defy this kingdom? Who would defy these armies? That's not what David states. He says, 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And there was a big difference because David understood the big picture. He was not looking at David. He was looking at God's kingdom. He was looking at something bigger and something greater. And I'm going to tell you something. When we, get, we come up against something in our life, when we come up against something in our walk with God, when we begin to look at the big picture and start, instead of looking at ourselves, I'm not being ugly, and realize that we're part of something bigger and a part of something greater and we're part of something, the kingdom of God. It changes our perspective. And David understood this. We, I'm not sure uh, what, what scriptures he would go through and I don't know uh, where this originated from with David. But Brother Barrier, if you could uh, read in 1 Samuel chapter 30, we find David... And I believe that this is probably where these men learned this from. But we find David, and they're coming back from a battle. And when you begin to read verse 1, go ahead and read. Help me out. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south... And Ziklag, and, and had smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Read. And had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. So David had been out at war. They come home, and I'm just going to paraphrase quickly for you. And they come into their city. Everything is gone. Everything they own is burned. And nobody's happy. Read. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. So this is a real situation. I know when we read it on the pages of our Bible, it's just, it's a story. But these men really are hurting. Everything they have is gone. David's with them. They weep. They weep until they don't have any strength to weep anymore. It's a terrible situation. Read. And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahinoam the Jezreeltist, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Now, they're against him. This is your fault. We were with you. We were were out fighting with you, and this happened. And they're turning against him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You want to know where these great men learned this? This is my opinion. I think they learned it on that day. You know the rest of the story. They go, they get their stuff back. And and so the relationship with David is mended at that point. But they never forgot this day. They never forgot this day when they had lost everything. They never forgot this day when they had turned against David. And David, I don't know if he got alone somewhere. I don't know if he did it right in front of them. I'm not sure how he did it. I'm not sure if he began to quote scripture. I don't know what he did. I don't know if he quoted Isaiah 41, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I don't know if he began to quote Isaiah 40 and 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I can go through lots of scriptures that possibly he quoted. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But I've come to tell you tonight, if we're going to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn to be able to strengthen yourself. You got to learn what it means to find a place to pray and begin to pray before God and feel that strength start coming into your spirit. Nobody helping you, nobody prompting you, nobody telling you to, but you find a place and say, okay, God, 
I've got to have an answer, and I need you. I'm telling you, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like those moments. There's nothing like it when you have gone to prayer and begin to seek God for an answer, and he comes on the scene and begins to strengthen you. So they strengthen themselves in the Lord. Number two, you must be willing to fight. And I don't mean scrapping amongst each other in the church. First Chronicles 11 and 12 says, And after him, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighties, he was with David. There was Philistines were gathered together to battle. There was a parcel of ground full of barley. People fled from before the Philistines. They set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it, slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. In our text, it talks about him fighting until his hand clave to the sword. And it's interesting, and you've heard messages preached about this, about them fighting over a bean patch, a lentil patch, a barley patch, a field If we can say it like this, a field with just full of beans. And you understand that it's much bigger than that. And and, in my thinking, it was just a place where they were done being pushed. It was a place where they had been pushed long enough. And they figured out that they were going to make a place and make a stand. And I'm going to tell you something. Every saint of God... Somewhere in your walk with God will be pushed far enough where you're going to have to make a decision and say, I'm not getting pushed anymore by the enemy. It's going to happen. You're going to have to make a stand and say, I'm done being pushed around. Parents, sometimes it has to do with your kids. And you have to take a stand and say, I'm done with the enemy pushing my family around. I'm taking a stand right here. It may just look like a bean patch to you, but I'm telling you it's more than a bean patch. There's got to be something that you absolutely are willing to fight for. Hallelujah. Many people say, well, that's not in my nature. We can give you plenty of examples. You can pick the sweetest Lady in this house, the quietest lady in this house, and let me start picking at their child, and you're going to watch something happen. It's natural. When you're willing to fight for something, usually it's something that's dear to you. It's something possibly that you have worked for. It's something you've dug out for yourself. Can I say it's something that you believe in, and it's something that you love. If I find someone that's not willing to fight for doctrine, then I understand. I'm not being ugly. That it's not really something that they love deep down inside of their spirit. It's something that they can take or they can leave. And I think we need to take note and and take inventory every once in a while and say, how much does this mean to me? How far will I go to fight for this? If someone starts talking against this doctrine, will I stand for it? Do I have enough to stand? Do I have enough in my spirit to get a hold of that sword in a sense and say, I'm not being pushed any further? And there's a difference between somebody who's willing to fight, let me just say this, and someone who's looking to fight. There's a big difference. And this isn't talking about people that are always walking around saying, oh, you don't believe that? Let's make something of it. That's not not what it's talking about. It's talking about a people that believe to the core of their soul in something they believe in it, and they've been pushed far enough, and they say, okay, I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm not being pushed any further. When it comes to the kingdom of God, I'm going to move on here quickly, but let me just say this. You need to understand where you stand with holiness stuff. You need, you need as a parent and, and as a family, you need to understand. It's not just my pastor's doctrine. It's my doctrine. That's what made them mighty men because they tied into the vision of the king and they understood where he was headed. And they understood what his vision was. And when someone kept pushing back on that, it came to a point where they said, no further, we're going to fight right here. And the scripture calls them mighty men because they, they fought for something they believed in. You need to know what you believe in tonight. 
You need to know why we do what we do. And, And if you don't, I challenge you, dig it out so you understand exactly why you believe what you believe. Because when you get to that point, you're willing to fight for it because you love it. Hallelujah. 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 So they were willing to fight. I'm going to move on. But it's interesting when you see in Samuel, it talks about him standing there by himself. Everyone left him. We can talk about that. There was a bunch of them, but they all left. And he said, I don't care what they did. I believe in it enough that I'll fight alone. Amen. Number three. I only got a couple more. Is they were sensitive to the king's desires. Let me make this clear very quick. I am not putting our pastors on a pedestal as the king tonight. I'm not. Jesus Christ is the king of kings. Period. I've stated this scripture of late that we follow them as they follow Christ. So when we talk about the king's desires, we're talking about God's desires. But many times that's manifested through the man of God. First Chronicles 11, 1 says, And David, then in the hold, and the Philistine's garrison was then at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, O oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. That's all Scripture says that he stated. We don't know how he stated it, but it just says he stated it. I don't know if he was sitting over to the side and he said it under his breath. I don't know if he told somebody that, but he did make the statement. It's inferred that he made it to himself. In verse 18, it says, And three break through the host of Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it back to David. You understand that all David made the statement was, it says, I'm thirsty. And I don't know if that water was different than water from other places. I don't know if it was sweeter. I don't know what was special about it, but that's what he desired. Scripture doesn't say he was asking for volunteers. Scripture does not tell us that he was trying to persuade anybody to do it. Scripture does not state that he threatened anybody and said, if you love me and you're mighty, you need to do it. Scripture does not state that he begged. It just simply says he made a statement. I sure wish I had a drink. And I can picture those type of men, honestly, sitting there and elbowing the other one and saying, do you hear that? What? David wants a drink. Get him a drink. No. He wants water from the well in Bethlehem where the enemy is. Ooh. Let's go. Are you serious? Let's do it. Can you picture three ornery guys just saying, let's go. Maybe this appeals to me because I can picture (laughs) just wanting to do it. Let's do it. Let's just go do it. But this says more about these men. They were sensitive. They understood the desire of, of the man of God in their life. He just inferred it. He just, he just kind of said, hey, you know, maybe you, maybe you shouldn't do that. He wasn't yelling at him. He wasn't berating him. He wasn't embarrassing him. It was just a desire of the man of God. And if we're going to be great and we're going to be mighty in the kingdom of God and be mighty men and women of God, we're going to be sensitive. We're going to be a people that's sensitive 
to the desire of the king. If I can put it like this, can it come to me through a Bible study? Or does it have to be an office visit? Can I be sensitive enough that when the word of God goes forward under the anointing through the man of God and something is preached and it's a principle of this book, can I get it? Am I sensitive enough to sit there and say, okay, God, are you talking to me tonight? Because if it's for me, I want to hear it. I know it's not for my brother or for my sister, but God, whatever you got for me, I want to hear it. Am I sensitive to the king's desires or does it come down the pike where it has to be something so, so pointed? I almost got to get smashed over the head with it before I can get it. No, 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 no. If I'm going to be mighty in the kingdom of God, I got to be sensitive to the king's desires. Can I get it when I'm just in my own devotion? I'm praying in the morning. And God starts dealing with me on something in my spirit. Something I know good and well shouldn't be there. Am I sensitive enough to say, okay, God, I got it. We're talking about the mighty men of David. They were sensitive to the king's desire. I have one more and I'm done. The fourth thing that they were willing to do or what made them mighty was recognize a potential problem and deal with it. First Chronicles 11 and 22 says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, it says that he slew two lion-like men of Moab and also, I've always loved this Scripture right here. This is, a, this is just a cool verse in the Bible. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. That's just, that's just cool. This guy sees a lion in a pit and crawls down in that pit and kills that lion. Verse Peter 5 and 8, as our musicians come. It says, be sober, and be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is seeking whom he may devour. Dictionary of Bible types states that a lion represents Satan, sin. So let's look at the reality of this story just very quickly. This man's walking down. This path, if I can say it like that, stand with me. And there's a pit. And there is a lion in the pit. If the lion's in the pit, that's a good place for the lion, amen? But something in this man thought a little bit different. The Dwayne, he looked in that pit and he saw that lion and he was glad it was there. And I don't know if he passed it and kept on walking and said, Woo, I'm glad it's in the pit. But something got a hold of him and he said, Wait a minute. What if that thing gets out? What if that thing gets out of that pit? I don't know if he thought in his mind, I got kids at home. I got things valuable at home. And I don't want that lion ever getting a hold of them. And while it's in the pit, I'm going to go kill it. I know where it's at. I know it's a lion. And I know its potential. And even though it's in a pit, I'm going to take care of it. That's something. When you liken that to the kingdom of God and you begin to think about that, let me just say it like this. Only you know what the lions are in your life. Only you and God. And a mighty man or woman is somebody that recognizes them 
and is willing to deal with them even when they're in a pit and they're not hurting anything. Simply based on the potential of what it could do. If we, if we really dealt with things in our life like that, because we all are human and we all have to deal with stuff. If we dealt with stuff like that, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's something that may come and get me or my family someday. I'm dealing with it right now. It would change a lot of outcomes. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm telling you, I want this church to be great for the kingdom of God. This people to back the vision of the man of God. I want it to be said in years to come, that was a mighty church. It did mighty things in the kingdom. It affected this world. It affected this inland empire. I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. It's not just going to happen with great men of God in our life. It's not. And I'm not taking away from them. It's going to take a great church diving into the vision that the great men have and backing it up and saying, okay, I want to be considered mighty in the kingdom of God. Not just my neighbor, not just the person across the aisle, not just that. No, 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 no. It's going to take all of us tying into this vision saying, okay, God, we want to be mighty for your kingdom. We want to do great things as a church, as a people. We want to back the men of God in our lives. We want to, we want to do great and mighty things. If that's beating in your heart tonight, can you lift your hands to him? Let's begin to talk to the Lord right now. God, I don't want this just to be simple Bible study tonight. I want this to get down in my spirit. I want to be great in the kingdom of God. I don't say that proud. I want to be great in your kingdom, God. I want to do great things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If that's beating in your heart tonight, as they begin to play and sing just for a few minutes, we're getting out early tonight. I wonder if we can come to this altar. Let's talk to God for a few moments. Let's let him know how we feel about the word that has been brought tonight. God, I want to be great in your kingdom. We want to do great things in your kingdom. Oh, come on, just for a few minutes tonight. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.